Hi there, my name is Don Boudreaux. I'm a professor of economics at George Mason University and a senior fellow at George Mason's Mercatus Center. And I'm here today to talk about Adam Smith and his views on trade and the economy. So let's get started. Uh, trade policy is always somewhere near the the top of policy discussions. So when I, you know, 40 years ago when I was in college, you know, people talked about trade. 20 years ago, they talked about trade. Uh, never in my lifetime has trade policy been quite as uh, uh, prominent in public policy discussions as it is today, as it really has been since just before President Trump won uh, uh, election in twenty in, in, in November of twenty sixteen, uh, and and what we've seen in that time is a a reemergence of what I call proud mercantilism. Until about five years ago, mercantil mercantilist beliefs, this notion that imports are bad, exports are good, what we want to do is in, in, increase the amount of money we get from foreigners. Uh, uh, it, for whatever reason, people, at least in the United States, were embarrassed to express this view. So you had these mercantilist notions motivating people, but a lot of people were clever enough to sort of hide them behind uh, a veneer of reasonable sounding economic explanations. President Trump has led the way or maybe opened the floodgates to a whole raft of people who are now embracing mercantilism. and and protectionism in an overt way uh, and a species of protectionism, a sort of more virulent species of it, is what's called industrial policy. It comes in different flavors and different varieties, different sizes, shapes and, 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 and odors. Uh, but what industrial policy, they all share, no matter what version you, you're, look, you're, you're, you're considering, is the vigorous and discretionary use of tariffs, in, import tariffs and export subsidies to pick winners at home, pick industrial winners in the, in, in the home economy in an attempt to, to defeat uh, foreign governments. One of the uh, chief views of mercantilists is that there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world, or at least the amount of wealth in the world is, is largely independent of human institutions and, 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 and human behavior. And if that were true, then no, way, no nation could grow wealthier unless another nation or other nations themselves grew poorer. So it was a, it was a very zero-sum view of the world. And Donald Trump and a lot of the uh, uh, conservatives today who are chiming in with their own schemes and plans for protectionism and industrial policy, they have a very zero-sum view of the world. They want America to grow rich, and if, if it's true that the amount of wealth in society is fixed, then indeed America can grow rich only by making other countries poorer. The mercantilists was described as, as be, the beggar thy neighbor thesis. You, you can't get rich unless you turn your neighbor into a beggar. And among the many things that Adam Smith shows, this is a nonsense view. The amount of wealth in the world is not fixed. The amount of wealth in the world grows. It grows as the division of labor expands. We know now it grows as, as, as innovation occurs. Clearly the amount of real material wealth in our world today of 2020 is unbelievably larger than it was during Adam Smith's day of, of 1776, and it was larger then than it had been a few centuries before that. Um, and so, uh, uh, but, but, but Mr. Trump and his conservative allies, they don't understand this. And let me quickly say, it's not just conservatives. I mean, there are industrial policy advocates on, on, on the left. You listen to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on trade and industrial policy and immigration, they don't sound very different than Trump. The style of their language is a bit different, but they're basically endorsing the same policies. We're going to have Fortress America. Uh, we're not going to let Americans buy as they choose from abroad. Uh, we are going to, going to appoint wise and intelligent people to powerful positions in Washington and give them the power to dispense these protections and, and, and to dispense subsidies. And somehow that will make us uh, a, a great, because if we don't do it, then other countries will be doing it. And so the only way we can compete with other countries is to have our own industrial policy. 
uh, Adam Smith uh, uh, would have just waved this away as 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 as, as nonsense. Uh, nothing you can find very little uh, in Adam Smith, even as uh, a, as an intellectual mention that would support uh, this notion that we need industrial policy and industrial policy is is uh, beneficial or can possibly be beneficial for the country. Uh, but if you don't understand how trade works, if you believe that trade is zero sum, if you believe that imports are bad and exports are good, uh, if you don't like economic change, if you are afraid of the future brought about by an open-ended entrepreneurial driven process in which people are free to invest as they peacefully choose and people are free to spend as they peacefully choose. If you're afraid of the future that emerges in this entrepreneurial way, then naturally you want to clamp it down. And the only way to clamp it down is, or one way to clamp it down is, is, is with industrial policy. Uh, but, make, but make no mistake, to the extent that we use industrial policy, we will make the economy less dynamic. We will make uh, the economies uh, 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 grow less quickly, uh, and we will make the people in the economy uh, less prosperous than they would otherwise be. And if industrial policy is used too extensively, you can actually reverse things. You can actually make us uh, poorer than we are today.